Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Aquarium Online Academy with us here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. My name is Sophie. I'm a member of our education team here at the Aquarium. And behind me, I oh, not behind me, behind the camera, I am joined by my friend Courtney, who is going to be controlling all the fun stuff that you see going on behind me today, too. And also, if you are watching live with us, it's about nine, nine on the dot exactly here in Southern California, we have a text line for you if you want to text us in or call us for anything. That text number is 562-286-1838. So again, if you are watching along live with us and you want to share any observations, if you want to share any thoughts, feelings that you have with us, feel free to either call or text us and Courtney will let us know when we have someone who's letting us or who's hitting us up on that text line. And then if you're watching after the fact, we do have an email that you are more than welcome to email questions, concerns at. So our email is live at lbaop.org. So again, there are multiple ways for you to contact us, whether you are watching live right now or if you're watching it at another time. Now today, we do have something very, very excited planned. We are going to be going on our very own whale watch today. Has anyone out there ever gone whale watching before? I know that's something that I used to do as part of my job here at the aquarium, but now I get to hang out more in the studio and go on virtual whale watches like we are going to be doing today. So I'm going to give everyone a couple of moments to gather whatever materials you're going to need for your whale watch. I know when I go out there, one of the things that I really need is sunscreen, sunglasses, maybe a hat, maybe a jacket, and for sure binoculars so we're able to spot those animals. So I'll give everyone a couple moments. I'm going to step off, grab those items that I need, and then we'll go ahead and get on board and start talking about what we are going to be looking for today. So let me just grab my stuff and I will be right back. All right, everyone, so welcome aboard. Again, my name is Sophie. I'm one of our educators here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and I would like to welcome everybody on the RV Stewie, their research vessel Stewie, named after one of our big whale and dolphin fans here at the Aquarium. I'm so happy to have you all aboard today. So a couple of things before we get too far out in the ocean. Because these are wild animals, unfortunately, there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to spot anything. However, if we are all looking for three specific things, then we have a much better chance at finding some of these wild animals. The first thing we want to look for today may seem a little counterintuitive, but we actually want to look for a bunch of birds. You may be wondering, well, we're looking for different types of sea life. Why would we be looking for birds? Well, if we see a whole bunch of birds, the diving birds, diving into the water all at the same time or all after one another, then that means those birds are eating and if those birds are eating right below the surface, chances are there's other life eating right below the surface too. So that's our first thing to look out for today. Secondly, we want to be on the lookout for splashes. And that's because dolphins, when they travel together, sometimes travel in very, very large numbers. We call those pods of dolphins. And they are very acrobatic, very energetic, and we can usually see their splashes from a good distance away. Now, last but not least, all marine mammals, just like us humans, do have to breathe air in order to survive. When those larger, really big baleen whales come up to the surface, when they exhale, they emit what is called a blow. And a blow looks like a small geyser or mist coming up out of the water, kind of shooting straight up. And that's how we know that one of those larger baleen whales is hanging out in the area. So again, those bigger animals like the greys, the humpbacks, the blue whales. Those are all types of baleen whales, and those are all the ones that will blow up into the air. So again, those three things we are all looking for today are going to be all of our diving birds diving into the water, splashes from our dolphins, and blows from those larger baleen whales. And when we see something, we're going to go ahead and slow down and stop the boat. So feel free to get up and move around to get the best view or angle of the animal. And we will point it out to you using the boat just like a clock. So directly in front of us will be our 12 o'clock, to the right of us will be our 3 o'clock, directly behind us will be our 6 o'clock, and then to the left of the boat will be our 9 o'clock. So if you hear me shouting out random numbers, that's because that's where the location of the animal is. So Captain Courtney, I think everyone's gotten the safety briefing. I think it's time for us to keep going to see what else we can find out there. 
So let's see if we can kick up speed a little bit. Everyone make sure you're holding on to all loose items. We don't want anything flying away today. And we'll start looking for some of those things. Courtney will let us know when we have something spotted. We may have to speed up. We may have to slow down once we spot it. But Captain Courtney, we are in good hands. <gasps> Courtney said we might have gotten a blow. All right, we may have to get a little closer to see what it is. What do we got, Captain Courtney? Let me put my binoculars down. <gasps> oh my goodness. It looks like we have a whale that has just come up and surfaced. Now, as we take a closer look at this whale right here, we can talk about how we see those two blowholes that are very nice and prominent on this animal. Because whales are mammals just like how we are, these animals do need to come up and breathe every so often. Some whales can hold their breath for up to an hour, like the sperm whale. Other animals may hold their breath between maybe intervals of 15 to about 20 minutes. But because those blowholes are really useful for these animals to breathe, the location of it is actually something that's very, very important. Let me step off screen and show you one of my animals that I got over here so that we can visualize it a little bit better. So as we're taking a look at this whale right here, when we're looking at it or we think about where we as humans breathe out of, we have our nose and our mouth, which is on the front of our face. That's perfect because usually we're spending time upwards. We don't spend as much time in the water. So being able to breathe in through our mouth and our nose is very helpful. Now, if we look at this whale model that I'll, I have right here, you'll notice that the mouth of the whale is near the front. For the whale that we're looking at right now, you can't really see the mouth because it's underwater. So that means every time a whale wants to breathe, if it were to breathe in through its mouth, it would have to come up out of the water like this open its mouth, take a big deep breath, and then dive back down. Now that takes a lot of energy, especially for an animal as massive as the blue whale that we're looking at right here. So with the whale's blowholes, it's gonna be on the top of their head like this. So all they have to do is come out of the water a little bit, stick their blowhole out, do a big exhale, take a big inhale, and then they can go and dive back down. Now, we haven't seen a fluke quite yet, but when whales go on a big dive, they show us their tail kind of like this. And that is what is known as a fluke. So when a whale's swimming, it'll come up to breathe, kind of kick, and then go down like that. So that's how we know a whale is on a much deeper dive if we see its fluke or its tail. Now, right now, we have the awesome pleasure of seeing a blue whale right here in front of us. And blue whales are some of the largest animals on the planet. In fact, they're one of the largest animals that we know to exist on our planet. Just for a little bit of a size reference, these animals can grow between 80 to 110 feet long. Think about the size of a school bus. That's maybe 20 or 30 feet long. Blue whales can get up to 110 feet long. So these animals get very, very big. They can also weigh anywhere between 170 to 200 tons. That is absolutely ridiculous to think that these animals can grow that big. They're also some of our loudest animals too. Now earlier I mentioned that these are a type of baleen whale. Does anyone know or has anyone heard about what the term baleen whale means? I'll give you a couple moments if you want to pop something in the chat. So baleen whales, these are a very special type of animal. They are what we call filter feeders, and I'm sure some of us are already familiar with what it means to filter feed. So these animals take in really big mouthfuls of water with a bunch of tiny little plankton in it, and then they use these fibrous baleen plates that hang off the roof of their mouth right here to catch all that krill. Oh, Courtney says we might have another baleen whale. Let's go ahead and see what it is. Let's take a look and see what our next baleen whale is gonna be. Oh my goodness. We're seeing a humpback whale that is lunge feeding right now. So we're getting a perfect look at that beautiful mouth of baleen that it has on the animal. So I always like to joke around and say that baleen whales don't have the best eating habits, or maybe they're not the most polite with their table manners when they're eating. And that's because these animals don't really chew their food. Like I said, they'll take in gallons of water in their mouth with those tiny little pieces of krill that they like to eat. So when we're looking at the baleen on this whale, it's all these plates that you see right here. Those are kind of hair-like structures, 
and it is made out of the same thing our nails and hair are made out of. So it's made out of keratin. Now, if I switch over to my document cam really quickly too, I can show everyone what the baleen looks like a little bit as well. So let me go ahead and get our uh, light turned on so we can see it a little bit better. So this is just one piece of baleen. So what we saw were hundreds of rows of baleen hanging off the roof of the mouth of that whale. So right here, we have one singular piece of baleen. You can see that right here, it's a little tougher, kind of a harder material. And down here, it's kind of soft and almost hair-like. I like to think of these, of the texture, kind of like dried pasta noodles. They're a little bit flexible, but kind of tough. So all these little pieces right here are going to help better catch those tiny little pieces of food they like to eat. And if you're wondering what food these animals like to eat, well, their favorite food is a small little type of plankton called krill. And you can see my hand for size reference. These little krill are tiny. They're about this big, maybe an inch or so. So these whales will eat about four tons of krill every single day just in order to keep themselves the size that they are. So that's something that is crazy impressive about these animals. They are always eating, constantly finding krill like this in order to feed themselves. But because they're such a big animal, they have to eat a lot of it. Now, if we go back and take a look at our humpback again, we're looking at a slightly different type of baleen whale. Now, these ones still don't have the teeth, like how the blue whale doesn't have any teeth, but humpbacks are a different kind of species. What's really fun about humpbacks is that these are animals that are very, very acrobatic. Sometimes we see them jumping out of the water in what we call a breach. And that's because these animals are smaller than a blue whale, and they're able to actually push themselves out of the water. We said the blue whales grow between 88 to 110 feet long, and they can weigh upwards of a whole bunch of tons. Now, humpbacks are a little bit smaller. They grow maybe between 52 to 56 feet, and they can weigh about 25 to 40 tons. Remember, we said the blue whales can weigh... The humpbacks are definitely... Oh my god, this is the best guy! However, these ones are some of the most acrobatic, and that's because they have very long pectoral flippers, or kind of arms almost, and that's how they can push themselves out of the water. And oh my goodness! Right as I was talking about it, it looks like we got to see a humpback breaching right now, too. So you can see, it's kind of jumping out of the water a little bit like an airplane. So if everyone takes their, their humpback flippers right here, we'll pretend our arms are our flippers, they kind of push themselves out of the water like that, and then they usually do a little bit of a twirl, and then kind of land back down in that big splash. And that's what we're able to see very nicely right here. Now you may be wondering to yourself, why do humpbacks or why do whales like to jump out of the water? Why do they like to breach? And that's actually a question that a lot of scientists and a lot of researchers are still trying to find the answer to. It would be awesome if we could speak whale, if we could just go up to them and ask them, why did you jump out of the water? Why are you breaching? But unfortunately, we are not able to communicate efficiently with these animals because we don't speak the same language as them, although that would be super cool. So one of the things that we hypothesize or that we think is we may think humpbacks like to breach to get energy out. Sometimes it's when they're very playful or sometimes it may be to scratch an itch. But a lot of the time when humpbacks are breaching or jumping out of the water, they may not be communicating with us humans, but they may be communicating with other humpbacks. One of the ways that they're able to impress their mates or if they're trying to show off for another whale they can do all sorts of breaching and all sorts of acrobatics because that's pretty impressive and it is going to be able to impress another whale. In places like Hawaii and other areas in those tropical regions near the Pacific, we see a lot of humpbacks that are going there in order to find mates. So that means in Hawaii and those places, they get a lot of breaching, a lot of fun acrobatics from those humpbacks because those animals are going there for the purpose of impressing another whale. And that's when they're going to bring out all the tricks, all the fun stuff. And that's when we see a lot of whales breaching, especially in those Hawaii areas. So if you ever want to see some cool stuff from those humpbacks, I think you know where you'll be able to go whale watching. All right, so we had a really good show so far. We were able to see a blue whale, one of the largest animals on the planet. And we also saw the most acrobatic ones, our humpbacks. 
Now we are getting a gorgeous look at a gorgeous look at one of their flukes as these animals go on a little bit of a deeper dive. Because they're mammals, they do have to come up at some point, but it can be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes before we see these animals again. So Captain Courtney is giving us the signal that it is time for us to continue going, see what else we can say out there. So let's go ahead and wave bye to our whale friends for now, and we're going to start venturing off to see what other stuff we can find. So remember, friends, now that we're going to keep going out onto the ocean, we're going to need our binoculars again. Go ahead, grab those sunglasses so that you can see better, and it's time for us to keep adventuring out there. Captain Courtney says we might have a spotting. We think we may see a little bit of splashing off of our two o'clock. Remember, oh, when splashing, when we see splashing, we know that that means we have dolphin friends that are hanging out with us. So it looks like we have a gorgeous Pacific white-sided dolphin that is jumping out of the water right now. So remember, dolphins are a slightly different type of whale. Yes, they are still considered whales, but what's different is that these dolphins will have teeth. So that means they do have slightly better table manners. They are able to catch and chew their food. So since we know that dolphins have teeth, they have little short cone-shaped teeth, what type of food do we think these animals may like to eat? Let's think about it. If they have short cone-shaped teeth, they can probably catch things that are a little bit fast, a little bit small, maybe things that are slippery. And what do we know that's slippery that lives in the ocean? Hmm. Well, these dolphins like to eat small little types of schooling fish and squid. They like to eat little schooling fish called capelin or herring or things like that. And they also really like to eat squid too. So this will be different than what those baleen whales like to eat. The baleen whales like to eat a lot of different types of plankton. And these toothed whales, the dolphins, these animals like to hunt after squid and other types of fish. Now, what's a little different about these dolphins is not only are their teeth and the way they eat different, they also only have one blowhole on them. So if we take a look at our dolphin, you can kind of see it. Let me move over. You can kind of see it right there is where the blowhole is on this animal. And you'll notice that they only have one singular blowhole. So all toothed whales, orcas, dolphins, sperm whales, will only have the one blowhole. But those bigger baleen whales will have two blowholes. So that means that when we are whale watching and looking for these animals, when a dolphin exhales at the surface, it may not shoot up as high as a bigger baleen whale, and we don't really get that blow from them. So when we're looking for dolphins, we want to look for things like splashes or look for those diving birds because that's how we know that we have dolphins in our area. And it looks like we just now got a nice pod of those dolphins too. What's really fun about dolphins is that they are super social creatures, just like how we as humans are social creatures. That means we usually see them hanging out together in groups. And when we see a group of dolphins together, that is called a pod of dolphins. Dolphins are super social, just like us humans. So that means they enjoy being around each other. And they also enjoy working with each other, too. These dolphins tend to work together very well. So what that means is they will all hunt and find their food together as an organized pod. What's unique about dolphins is that they are also incredibly intelligent animals. They have some of the largest brain to body ratios compared to humans and compared to other animals like primates. That means that these dolphins are very smart, so much so that they actually know their own strengths and weaknesses. That means that the dolphins know what they're good at and know what they may not be good at. That comes in very handy when these animals are hunting together because if one dolphin is really good at bubble netting, that's swimming around the school of fish and creating bubbles to group them all together, that means that the dolphin who's good at bubble netting will go do that, while maybe another dolphin who's good at hunting fish will go and catch all the fish. So that's how these animals work together very well. And earlier, I mentioned a little bit about how the humpbacks sometimes use jumping out of the water as a way to communicate with others or as a way to signal. Now, those bigger baleen whales also have songs that they sing sometimes. If anyone wants to practice singing those whale songs at home, I encourage you to do so. But dolphins also communicate with each other, and it sounds a little bit different. They kind of let out a series of clicks or whistles, and that's how they're able to communicate with each other. And dolphins also have different languages or different dialects depending on what area they live in. 
there's different types of languages that exist around the world, even within the same language. So because of the different areas or regions that they're in, that's how those languages may vary. And the same thing happens with dolphins. If we were to take a dolphin from here in Southern California and place it with a pod maybe in Australia, it may not know how to communicate with those dolphins right away because they have different ways of communicating with each other. So that's something that's really special about these animals too, is that they are incredibly smart, they work together very well, and they have those different languages. Now, dolphins are also animals that are very, very good hunters. So when we see birds, usually we're able to see other dolphins too. And that's because a lot of animals in the animal kingdom know that dolphins are good hunters and they know that all they have to do is find the dolphins and the dolphins will lead them to food. Not only do the dolphins work together very well in order to find their food, but they also have something special called echolocation. Has anyone heard of that word echolocation before? It's the same thing that bats have. I'm not sure how many other animals have it, but I know for sure that bats can echolocate. Dolphins have it too. So basically what happens is these animals send out a series of clicks. They will then bounce off of different objects in the area, whether that be other fish, other animals. So when that signal bounces back to them, the dolphins will use the front part of their brain to create sort of a mental image of what's in the area. So when they echolocate, they're able to find their food better. And then when they all work together, they're able to make sure that whole pod eats together. So dolphins are an animal that I think are very, very cool. However, one of my favorite types of dolphins, I think would have to be the orca. Those are just really, really big ones. Now, oh my goodness, did we just find an orca right now? It's almost like I talked it into existence. How exciting. Thank you, Captain Courtney, for finding us this super, super rare animal. So I was just about to say how crazy it is to see orcas here in Southern California sometimes. And that's because there are different types of orcas that exist. All the other animals we saw today have different seasons in Southern California. Blue whales we tend to see more often in the summertime like this. Humpbacks we can see in the spring, in the summer, and we get juvenile or young humpbacks anytime throughout the year. Those dolphins that we saw earlier, we typically see pretty much year round, but orcas are super rare. I think the last time we saw them here in California was a couple months ago, but the time before that, it was a whole year since we had seen orcas. Now, orcas are just like a really big version of a dolphin. So remember all those things we said about dolphins, they work together, they echolocate, they're good hunters. These are all things that orcas have too. Now, orcas are going to be a lot larger than those smaller dolphins we saw earlier. So that means they can hunt bigger things. But the reason why it's really rare to see orcas here in Southern California is because there are different types of orca populations that exist. There are orcas that are called resident orcas. That means they live in a certain place year round. There are transient orcas. There are ones that migrate around. And there are offshore orcas, ones that stay further offshore that we don't get to see that often. Every now and then here in Southern California, we'll get some of those transient pods coming through. But what I think is really awesome about orcas is because they stick together in a pod, they have really big families. And usually those families, sometimes they are run by the women orcas or the female orcas, the moms. So sometimes we'll get pods of grandmas, great grandmas, moms and their babies all hanging out together. So I think that's something that is super neat about this species. And we're getting a gorgeous look at the rest of the pod that we see right here too. You'll notice they have very long dorsal fins that stick up out of the water. And depending on if it's a near shore or an offshore, a transient or a resident, their colorings and the height of their dorsal fin will vary depending on what type of animal they are. For resident orcas, I know there are some that live up in the Washington, Puget Sound, Seattle area. So if anyone is watching from up there in the Washington area, you can go whale watching near the San Juan Islands or a little bit further up north in British Columbia, Canada, and you'll get a really good chance to hopefully see some of these orcas. Now up in the Washington, British Columbia area, the type of orcas that live up there are called the Southern Residents. And the southern residents stay in that area year round and they really like to eat all the salmon and all the tasty fish that washington and the pacific northwest has to offer so if anyone's watching from up there and wants to go whale watching going to the san juan islands or that area will be a great place to find them 
Now, the orcas that we get here in Southern California, these animals can eat a variety of things. They may eat other types of marine mammals like seals, sea lions. Orcas that live in much cooler areas may be eating animals like penguins or leopard seals. But the orcas that we may get here in Southern California can eat a mix of different things. It's hypothesized that orcas are able to eat juvenile great whites. So we see that happening off the coast of South Africa often. But here in Southern California, we're not too sure what these animals can eat. But luckily, we have a whole bunch of different types of food for orcas here in Southern California. So if they do decide that they want to stop to eat while they're moving around, we do have plenty of tasty food to offer them. The in and outs not included, but there's a lot of really fun stuff in the ocean that these animals will be able to eat. So this was an awesome pod that we were able to take a look at right now. I think we have time to maybe look at one more animal as we're on our way back. So let me grab my binoculars again. We'll see if we have time to spot one more animal. All right, so let's look. Captain Courtney will let us know when we spotted something, but hopefully we get something on our way back. That would be really neat. <gasps> Captain Courtney says we spotted something. Oh my goodness, now that we're back in the harbor, it looks like we're able to see a gray whale. It's another one of those baleen whales, so we get a really good look at those two blowholes on it. Upon first glance, you'll notice that yes, the gray whale is gray, but there's also all these white spots all over it. You may be wondering to yourself, what is all that stuff on the whale? And gray whales oftentimes have a lot of barnacles and a lot of lice growing on them. So that's why we see all this stuff on the whale. Now, right when we came up on the whale, you might have noticed some things that looked kind of brown floating around the animal. Oh, where it looks like it's doing it again. What this whale is doing, it's not going to the bathroom. It is actually eating right now. So gray whales are a baleen type of whale, but they will feed a little bit differently than those other ones. Remember, when we saw the humpback, it was opening its mouth on the surface of the water. Gray whales kind of do the opposite. They like to dive down to sandy, muddy bottoms, take in mouthfuls of mud, and then use their baleen plates to pick up things like little crustaceans, little things that may hide in the sand. So what it's doing right now is releasing all of that mud out of its mouth in order for it to actually get that yummy, tasty food that it wants to eat. So whenever we see gray whales feeding, it's really obvious because we see all that mud coming up out of them. So to be able to see a gray whale feeding right now is something that's very cool. Now, gray whales have one of the longest migrations of any mammal in the ocean. They travel about 14,000 miles. These animals can be found in the Bering Sea region, so up north, and they travel about 7,000 miles down the west coast to Baja, California, or the Mexico area, and they will have their babies in those warm lagoons down there and also look for mates. Those warm lagoons offer really good protection for a young baby gray whale to first enter into the world. So once those babies are a little bit older when they're ready to make that journey, then the grays travel another 7,000 miles back up north to their home. They typically don't stop to feed, so being able to see these animals feeding right now, especially here in our own harbor, is something that was very, very special to see today. So my friends, we had an amazing trip out there. We got to see a whole bunch of different types of baleen whales. Just to kind of summarize it for you, we started off by seeing the biggest animal on the planet, the blue whale, and then we were able to see a humpback that was breaching. Then we got to see a couple different types of dolphins, our Pacific white-sided, and then the orcas, which are some of my personal favorites. And then lastly, we ended with a gray whale feeding right here in the harbor. Now, these are all animals that need some of our protection and need some of our support. So as always, we always want to think of ways that we can conserve these animals and conserve their habitats. Some of the things that we can do to better protect whales and dolphins are to eat sustainable seafood when we can. That means eating seafood that is responsibly and locally sourced, and they're not using really big nets that these animals may get tangled in. Something else that we can do, too, is pick up trash whenever we see it. We don't want trash to end up in the ocean, and even though these animals are very big, a lot of those smaller animals that they like to eat may accumulate a little bit of plastic or trash in them, and that can work its way up the food chain. And lastly, some of the things we can do 
or just to talk to our friends and family about some of the animals we saw today or how inspiring it was to see the largest animal on the planet right before our eyes. So I really hope you enjoyed whale watching with me today. I know I did too. As always, if you have any questions or if you want to let us know about anything, we have our email and our phone number down here at the bottom. So we have 562-286-1838 if you want to text or call us. And if you want to email us, tell us about how you enjoyed the whale watch or if you have more whale questions, especially if you want us to ask our whale and dolphin expert anything, go ahead and email us at live at lbaop.org. So once again, everyone, thank you for joining us. I hope everyone gets off the boat nice and safely, and we will see you all next time. Bye.